Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, I'm happy to introduce to you Carolyn Wright, whose nine volumes of poetry include Seasons of Mangoes and Brain Fire. Sebo, can you speak closer to the microphone? Closer to the mic. All right. Carolyn Wright's nine volumes of poetry include Seasons of Mangoes and Brain Fire, which won the Blue Lynx Prize and the American Book Award. Um, another book is A Change of Maps, which was winner of the 2007 IPPY Bronze Award, uh, and Mania Klepto, the Book of Yulene. <laughs> Caroline, and like lots of people here, is a Seattle native. And she studied with Elizabeth Bishop and Richard Hugo, another Seattle native. She teaches at the Northwest Institute of Literary Arts Whidbey Writers Workshop MFA program. That's a long title. And for Seattle's Richard Hugo House. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you all for inviting me, and thank you, Sybil, for inviting me, and, uh, you know, thank you all for attending. I know you're here for city business, so um, the poem I'm going to read is called This Dream the World is Having About Itself. Now, it's in quotation marks because it is, uh, it's the title of my poem, but it's also the first line of a poem by William Stafford, the late beloved poet laureate of Oregon, uh, and a poet much loved here in the Northwest. So the poem begins with his line as the title and then continues. The name of his poem is Vocation, so you'll hear that referred to toward the end. This dream the world is having about itself won't let us go. The western sky gathers its thunderclouds. It has no urgent need of us. That summer in our late teens, we walked all evening through town. Let's say Cheyenne. We were sisters at the prairie's edge. I who dreamed between sage green pages and you a girl who feared you'd die in your 20s. Both of us barefoot, wearing light summer dresses from the 30s, our mother's good old days before her generation won the war and moved on through the 40s. As we walked, a riderless tricycle rolled out slowly from a carport Fathers watered lawns along the subdivision's treeless streets. We walked past the last houses and out of the 50s. The Oregon Trail opened beneath our feet like the dream of a furrow turned over by plow blades and watered by Sacagawea's tears. What did the fathers think by then, dropping their hoses without protest as we girls disappeared into the 60s? We walked all night, skirting the hurricane force winds in our frontier skirts so that the weather forecasts for the 70s could come true. The Arapahoes' final treaties for the inland ranges could fulfill themselves ahead of the building sprees. We walked on, but where was our mother by then? Your lungs were filling with summer storms, and my eyes blurred before unrefracted glacial lakes. Limousines started out from country inns at the center of town. They meant to drive our grandparents deep into their 80s. Our mother, in her remodeled kitchen, whispered our names into her cordless phone, but before the 90s were over, both of you were gone. Mother's breath was shadow, but her heart beat strong all the way into the cloud wall. You carried your final thoughts almost to the millennium's edge, where the westward-leaning sky might have told us our vocation. We would, in open fields, we would watch the trail deepen in brilliant shadow and dream all the decades ahead of us. And that's in memory of my sister. Thank you. Thank you.
And Sybil will introduce our poet today. Okay, well, our poet today is Anne Spires, and she is that rare individual because she is an actual Northwest native, right? and not an import like most of us. She grew up in Seattle on Capitol Hill, her family being part of the post-World War II generation of large families. She earned a BA and master's degree in literature and creative writing at the University of Washington. Her poems have appeared in lots of local journals like Raven Chronicles, Fine Madness, Seattle Review. She has several collections of poetry, including What Rain Does, the Herodotus poems, and letterpress editions, Volcano Blue, A Wild Taste, and Tide Turn. And presently, she is the Poet Laureate of Vashon Island. Oh, Anne. Thank you, Sybil. I grew up on Capitol Hill post-World War II when it was a very scrappy neighborhood. And in the last few years, I've been privileged to come back to Seattle as a grandmother doing childcare to my two grandkids in Columbia City. And this is what this poem is about. And um, the school that's mentioned is Hawthorne Elementary. The park is Genesee Dump. Now um, it's changed its name, I think, to Wetmore Slough and Rainier Playfield or something like that. And um, the lake, of course, is Lake Washington. My son was lucky enough to marry a Thai woman, and they've had two kids, and that's who I'm grandmother to. To an infant. The bright light settles you out here on the porch, glassed in. I hold you, your arms and legs tucked to your chest as if in the womb. I show you what is out there, what's down those steps. To the left, the park where you will ride your bike, popping wheelies in the grass, rutting the green, and you will pump the swings aloft, someday launching yourself. Straight ahead, the lake where salmon still migrate from the ocean to spawn to die. In late August, you will swim, dive for dimes, and come up shiny and wet. You will watch girls' dark cleavages deepen, and you will dance as their breasts lift. And at the hill's mid-rise, the school, its new bricks covering old stone, teachers pile up the notebooks, full and heavy. Kids fill the rooms with the ricochet of so many languages spoken in this neighborhood, blocks of houses and lawns and sidewalks and street lamps. Your language will be English, Thai, Spanglish, hip-hop, Somalian, Chechen, Mandarin, Rez, a mix native to you and your friends. But for years, after you learn to walk, you will come home each night, up these stairs for a while, to touch your mother's shoulder, and at the dinner table, you will edge your father over a little more each night. For a while you will, that is. Then you will walk away, and I will remember for you this moment on the porch, and you in my arms wrapped so tight, and the east sun brightening your space here. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Our poet today is Paul Hunter, and I have known Paul for years and years and years, but I never knew how intimately connected with farming he was until he sent me this bio. You'll, you'll see. Um, Paul's a Seattle poet where he's worked as a teacher and for the past 18 years has published letterpress books and broadsides under the imprint of Woodworks, kind of close to our word. Work. His farming poems have been reviewed in the New York Times and have received Washington State Book Award. He has been a featured poet on the News Hour. His most recent book is Prose, One Seed to Another, The New Small Farming, published by The Small Farmer's Journal. And he has a new book of farming poems appearing in mid-May titled Stubble, Stubble Field. 
Paul is going to stand up, camera people. E pluribus unum. To carry through mountains like a secret weapon, we took it apart so it could not be prevented or planned against. For the surprise, for the impact, though we never thought of it as a weapon, this apparatus so practical, so complete, dismantled to carry on a piece at a time through emergencies, in bundles, in packs, in the pocket. We all watched this work of dismemberment so it would be upon all of us, though some more than others each bore part. All along there had been side effects. Hidden pieces would wear on each other, add contradictory meanings, misfits. Now, after the distance, the hardships, it must come together to work or be discarded. A burden, an accusation, worse than useless. No one here knows how it all went. If we even have all of it brought to this one place to work with. Because of the distance, the hardships, we no longer have all of us, though each stopping past what he carried. So perhaps missing parts amid far-flung now backwards ideas of, of returning each plate piece where it went, even doubting it ever was one in the first place, ever meshed and worked smoothly to do the work and lift spirits we stay up in ships by the fire, squint through smoke to turn things this way and that to catch flickering lights. Out of bad dreams, wake one another to try various fits at the trash heap. Anything not to abandon the one thought. Thank you, Paul. Paul uh, pointed out that he read the first uh, year on my city council here at the committee. So, second time around. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, today we are privileged to have the 2012-2014 Washington State Poet Laureate, Kathleen Flanagan. Um, her newest collection, Plume, from the University of Washington Press, is a meditation on the Hanford nuclear site. So you just need to buy that book in order to find out what that means. Her first book, Famous, was named a notable book by the American Library Association and a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. And her other awards include a Pushcart Prize and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Artist Trust. Please welcome Kathleen Flanagan. Thank you. News item. And it begins with a quotation from one of those health magazines that goes, new research suggests we have a fixed reservoir of self-restraint. <laughs> this is why at the end of the day, you smuggle bowls of ice cream to the TV. <laughs> or put another way, when you pushed your plate aside and hunger kneaded your gut for months. This is why you crammed the closet with new clothes and emerged from your diving bell in a breathless hotel room Why you let the coat fall from your shoulders. That manic week when you ironed every shirt and tablecloth, why you couldn't keep up with the grief. Last night, sirens passed close this morning, the airwaves crash and moil, and your mail is flooded with catalogs. This is why you've staged your house like a catalog, why you can't bear to open the bills, why streets are jammed with luxury cars and panhandlers, and your country is at war. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to introduce Esther Altshul Halfgott, whose work has appeared in many journals, including the Journal of Poetry Therapy, a Journal of Jewish Literature, Psychoanalysis, and the Human Sciences, Raven Chronicles, and Floating Bridge Review. Um, she's the founder of Seattle's It's About Time Writers Series, which is now in its 22nd year. And she's also the author of The Homeless One, a poem in many voices from Coda Press. She's been writing the blog Witnessing Alzheimer's, a care caregiver's view for the Seattle Post Intelligencer since 2008. And I believe she's going to read something yeah. on that subject today, too. So thank you. Esther? Fragments from an Alzheimer's Journey. He's sadness and thin, scared, confused, a bird looking for its mother. There is no pill for this, not for him, not for me. I give him a pear. He eats it all, bit by bit, until it's gone. Today I will wheel him to the window where he points outside and says, he's dying. I say, who's dying? He says, that guy. More and more he slips into himself, unwaiting for me to join him, a man still, the same face, hardly changed. But for cognition and the lack of affect, who would know he won't remember us when I leave? His face is my grandfather's, staring out from an old picture frame, a reminder that love is like the moon, wanting into different shapes, crescents, slits, Today, when I walked into his room, he was sitting in the wheelchair staring. His eyes were red, and I thought he had been crying, but there were no tears. He didn't know me. I looked straight into him and said, Hi, Abe. I'm Esther. I'm your wife. I'm Esther. Really? Really, I said. And he was alive again. He's better now. Recognized me when I came in. Took my hand and kissed it. Later, he kissed his own hand. He has a bruise, and he kissed the bruise as if he were a father caring for a child, something like the day he called himself he. Tonight at dinner, a dish of pears, six ounces of health shake, four ounces of apple juice, the rest spit out, chewing's hard, swallowing liquids easier. To myself, I think, I'm tired, I want to go home, but where is home? Here at the nursing home or in that other place where we used to live? He's bedridden. He's weak and tired. His hands curl into fists. They're cold and clammy. His arms are cool. The rest of him is warm. He opens his eyes and says, we did it, then falls back to sleep. How long can a body do this? Whose body am I talking about anyway, mine or his? I'm not sure I know the difference. Neither pear nor peach satisfy him. He barely drinks the shake and doesn't understand the word cookie. But he smiles and holds my hand. He calls me hun. When I leave, I kiss him and say goodbye again, again. Thank you. Esther, thank you very much for a touching poem. Of Thomas Pruxma, who is a writer, poet, translator, teacher, and magician, sometimes simultaneously. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether there will be simultaneity today or not. He, he won't tell me. His translations of the 12th century Tamil poet and saint Avayar, Avayar, okay, Give, Eat, and Live, were published by Red Hand Press, and his other books include The Body and the Earth, Notes from a Conversation, and A Feast for the Tongue. He has received fellowships from the U.S. Fulbright Program, the American Literary Translators Association, 
The Ohio State University, Oberlin Shansi, and Oberlin College. And the poem he's going to read today, he composed in response to the issues on the agenda for today, which I think is a first for the Wordsworth program. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Council. How do we build a city, a safe refuge for many people, a place of many places where many people want to dwell when the many may have many ideas about the city, the people, and the places the place might become. So many that, at times, it can tear them apart, pulling at the fibers, till the fibers start to fray, to what had seemed whole and truthfully woven, begins to look ragged, and not just around the edges, where the words that once carried music in their meaning have ceased to carry anything at all. What then can we do to bring it back together, to bind the many pieces without the pieces feeling bound? An ancient Tamil Nadu, land of Tamil, the great kings of the kingdom held counsel with poets, learned men and women who advised them in song calling them on their errors, praising them for their hearts, teaching them always the root of all art, the courage to listen and then act. Listen, listen, listen to the people, to their pains and their plans, and to the voice great within us, rising up and rising out, showing us the next step, the next way, the next word, the next wonder that makes the poem once again piecing the many pieces into more than just many, where everyone is welcome, where everyone is heard, where everyone can find shelter in the shelter we make from the words that weave us together. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. That, that was the I'm first time. I'm sitting right next to him, and I don't know how he did it. <laughs> there's, there's been magic before up here, but not quite as visible as that. <laughs> Our first item is Wordsworth, and our curator, Sybil James, will introduce our poet today. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm happy to introduce um, my friend and fellow poet, Ed Harkness. Um, Ed has published two poetry collections, one called <coughs> Saying the Necessary, and the most recent, Beautiful Passing Lives. His uh, poems have appeared widely in both print and online journals, and he currently teaches writing at Shoreline Community College. Thank you, Sybil. Great Apes at the Zoo. Behind the glass barrier and the laughter of children and parents, the mother is eating something the keepers have given her. She holds a rind, avocado, or papaya, as if it were a small Chinese bowl, lifting morsels of whatever it is to her mouth, then delicately licks her slender fingers. Squatting in straw, she seems Buddha calm, unaware of the gawking world, unaware, apparently, of her tussing tussling boys, one no bigger than the toddler beside me, his nose to the glass, squealing in recognition, as if he too would like to wrestle and box. The straw flies, dust rises in misty puffs. The little ape slaps his big brother, does a backflip, bumps his head on a log, runs to Mama and crawls on her back to catch his breath. Mama doesn't budge. She drops the rind and surveys the leafless climbing trees the keepers have installed. A webbing of ropes, an artificial stream, 
and across it the dark pocket of a concrete cave. Her eyes are bland, resigned, the eyes of any prisoner or refugee. The kids and parents have strolled away. Big brother shits in the straw, knuckle walks to the stream where he stirs the slack water and cups his hands to drink. The mother gazes off as if at some other life. She reaches back and lifts her little fellow over her head, rolls sideways onto the straw, and grooms him till he falls asleep. Thank you, Ed, very much. Very nice. Appreciate that. Day, December 12th, now 2.05 p.m. And as we usually do in my committee, we begin with uh, Wordsworth, a poetry program. And we've had uh, Sybil James as a curator in the past, now our curator for this coming year, and is a good friend of mine, as, as well as uh, Sybil's, is uh, Judith Roach, has been for a while, along for a while. Thank you. And uh, we're actually honored to have a very special poet today, Francis McHugh, who was one of the uh, founders of uh, founding director of Richard Hugo House. But I'll let you say the rest, Judith. Okay, I am honored to introduce Francis McHugh, a very fine poet, a teacher, and I love this, this part of her um, titles. She's an art instigator, um, and she works at it. She's a teacher, writer in residence now at the undergrad honors program um, at the University of Washington, um, and She's the founder of, or founding executive director of Hugo House, um, Francis. Oh, thanks, Judith. Thanks, Nick. I'm going to read a, a little poem about Kurt Cobain, who died almost 20 years ago. And each time I pass his house on Lake Washington Boulevard, I think of him and how our city has changed in the last 20 years. Where did you go, Kurt Cobain? Where did you go? I pass your old house, Nirvana boy, where a set of golf clubs rests against the big cedar gate, and grown-ups live there now. All the astrologers and dealers and hangers-on finally fallen away. Next to the park with scorches in the bench, candle wax frozen on the planks, where kids sit as little proto-punks, showing up from Omaha or Asheville or Cheyenne, tossed here like you from a dead town like Aberdeen. I could have been one of them, me too, lumber numbed and netted from a storm about to reappear. Here's a 20 year scream later for you, boy man, Clorox haired singer and the pain amidst riches that songs could not cure. I'm banging the steering wheel in my sing-along way while my screech heaves along the lake just down this boulevard Kurt Cobain, just down here, you put a rifle to your chin, to your sweet blonde head, and I was humming, I don't have a gun, no, I don't have a gun. Whammy across the water, taunting like all yesterdays, as the cap splat of the shot and the twang shriek of the song flipped back for years, and I hear it when I drive past. When I drive past, I hear it, I hear it at the beach, I can't help singing. Even now, you are the boy in long johns and smeared t-shirts and me backstage where the scream still leaks into the Seattle. We've sleekly become our big city, all that glass and wood scrubbed free of moss. With everyone else, I went to Seattle Center for the memorial when Courtney Love screamed the suicide note over the speakers and we prayed no kids would copycat your gun to chin knowing that the bands back then opened a room where kids lived in dream, where they played music plucked without scold, all the heroin they could shoot or hoof in the sway of being alive, together without real talk, just the old anthropology of riff and slouch and maybe making out at the crocodile. Boys knitted and girls twirled their hair, and we rattled through poems until they told us something the big tarot of being alive. 
I wanted to have art repair things and music console, even while we were all singing. And I don't have a gun. No, I don't have a gun. Thank you very much. Thank you.